Hello everyone. The title of today's episode is uh, becoming aware of uh, how the human being receives memory. So in other words, the title is How the Human Being Receives Memory. And of course everybody's experience is different because everybody has taken different steps. We all haven't come to the same road. In other words, physically on this earth, we have stepped in different places and have different experiences. However, when you try to look at how the human experience recollects, uh, let us take a scenario where there is anger. Let's say you just get angry at someone. (laughs) And... uh, you do something irrational and let's say just like how the Buddha suggested uh, uh, when you get angry it's like throwing coal uh, burning coal uh, you know to, to someone you're both burning your hands and the other person so let us say after an angry moment in which there has been some coal throwing uh, the person comes to the side and he's like gosh did I really need to do, do this and all that right there, you kind of see it's like, of course, everyone's way of thinking is different. I'm just one human being. This is one human being's experience. But what I've noticed is like, you recollect those moments as, as if you're still aware of it. What that means is we've, it's as if you, after anger, we feel bad simply because we are recollecting those moments which did not have to be at that tension. What that means is uh, many human beings, are, uh, especially those in city, they're living, even though they have depression and stress or whatnot, as some people say, uh, it's, uh, the human being is living at a certain level of comfortable experience. You know? And so if something happens throughout the day that is out of that range in regards to intensity and human communication with you, you begin to see your attention will be more on that because it's, it's as if it's kind of shaped more, do you know? And so I notice that as I'm trying to recollect after I'm angry, it's as if I'm still carrying those images. There's a Zen tale that says, uh, a Zen story that suggests that there were these two monks, I say this story quite often, thanks to uh, There are these two, mon- uh, two monks, and these two monks, one of them is a senior, one of them is a junior. The junior is pretty new, you know, to the game, to the monk game. So, <laughs> so while they're walking, the senior, which is very wise, he's walking, and the senior is right beside them, trying to learn from this monk's presence. And uh, they go to a river. As they go to a river or something, they see that there's this woman, this very, very beautiful woman. And of course, monks, uh, they, they had renounced, for example, being with women and being with many other things in regards to go through more of an internal exploration. However, uh, they see this very beautiful woman, and this beautiful woman can't get across. It's, it's not a river, but it's some kind of puddle or something the woman can't get across. So the senior monk, uh, they, they go there and the woman asks, and it's like the junior is like, no way we're going to help him, help her in his mind. Because he's thinking of rationally and very logically of the hierarchy and code of conduct that monks have. The senior monk, very surprisingly for the junior monk, goes and picks up this beautiful woman uh, and carries her across the river and puts her down, you know, across the puddle or whatever. And when he comes back, the, the face of the junior monk is like as if he's been slapped in the face. He doesn't understand what's happening, right? So the junior monk doesn't say anything. And on their way back as they're walking, the junior monk can't take it anymore. In other words, like he's shaking. He's like, what is this? I'm learning from this guy who doesn't even, you know, follow this. And he's not even a monk. Why did he touch? And so suddenly the kid, the junior monk, bursts out and tells the senior monk, sir, how could you touch that woman? Do you know? How could you, like, we are, are, are uh, as monks, we're not supposed to do that. Why did you do it? The senior monk looks at the kid who asked him why he carried the woman. And the monk, with a very graceful smile, the senior monk, tells the kid, I carried her and put her down on the other side of the river. You are still carrying her in your mind. 
And so the lesson of the senior monk to the stu junior monk was that it is a move awareness to the subtlety of thought, how we have one experience and we carry that and it's affecting our present moment. What that means is that junior monk in that walk with that senior monk was not enjoying the walk. He was totally thinking, gosh, why did, he th why did this senior monk touch the thing, right? And so suddenly you see it's like he was carrying uh, ignorance in the sense that his attention was on some subtler fabrication and it wasn't here. So he was carrying that projection uh, and not being aware of the projection in which one is present here. What that means is I think reality is just free imagination. <laughs> What that means is we are born here and we are given this platform of design and shape and body. And as we become aware of it, we begin to see that the sense of transience and the sense of transitions that one finds are in many levels. What that means is there's many different types of understanding as much as there's many different types of experience. And as much as there's many types of experience there, there is the wisdom of the uh, being who is, in a sense, uh, not completely associating with the object of experience, but also knowing the experience is simultaneously present. Uh, and this has nothing to do with visibility. Uh, there is the, I, Mr. Within finds that in regards to human thought, two thoughts have made mistakes. And this, they have started wars in the mind of man. And that is the concept of spirituality and the concept of that which is the opposite, for example, in regards to scientific ideology. Right? But we must understand that spirituality, it's the way the person is going towards that way of living, its reception is totally different than the person who is going based on a rationality. We think we human beings are the same, but our minds have developed differently. We have taken different steps. And that is why we find, for example, there have been many great poets who have written words and so many people have resonated because it was there. It was somehow present even though it was so individually there. So that moment, that being uh, went through pain suddenly reminded us in our abstraction of how we went through pain and whatnot. And so there's this elegance of shape flowing in, our, in who we think we are and what is happening. So guys, pretty much the Zen story is to suggest that it is something um, that when you become aware of thought, you also become aware of what is carrying you, you know, and you must become aware because in, in thought there is a mixture. So what that means is uh, thought is actually, there's no such thing as thought. Thought is in, situated in a transcendental platform. What that means is you cannot become aware of thought if you are not uh, uh, multi-present. There is no space to have subtlety, you know? It's that moment where you thought that there was one human being in one world, but you realize that that human being was the origination of the projection of the world. What that means is you can choose to open your eyes you know, and look at something or could you choose to, for example, uh, close your eyes and not see something. Human choice means human difference is fundamentally how humans are being united. So what that means is you must have as much freedom to be as unique as you want, as you can, as me, as me, as me, and as everybody else. Do you see? It's, it's like a, we want one thing in human capability to suddenly go into other human uh, aspects of capability, you know, to other human beings. And it's kind of like that phenomenon. Think of it, you know how after sometimes you see it's rained and you see the drops come together. And it's like, you know, you're observing behind the window the drops of a water coming and suddenly blending and suddenly getting momentum. In this reality, an integrative view gives you a momentum beyond just acknowledging uh, a, a, a just a certain world. Because certainty is, uh, is kept firm by your history. What that means is when I, when I ask someone, uh, uh, how, how do you know you're here? I hear many stories. But when I look at them, nobody answers in, in a silence that knows that the, this, is, this question is not, does not have an answer. There are moments in man's understanding simply suggested based on how we have the concept of a paradox. We can have simultaneous uh, linear patterns to beside one another, non-linearly even. Because if causality, if, if everything is in an instant occurring, there is no cause and effect. 
cause and effect becomes how, uh, in that instant, worlds were projected. So, as many as some have suggested, in a blink of an eye, your world can change. That is very true. Because your awareness to your world has been changing since day one. And every moment in which you're becoming aware of living, the living which you are doing, you, you become inspired by the flows of how things are coming to you. This includes how suddenly you get thoughts throughout the day. This includes also how much you trust in your environment and feel from your environment. This could be, in, in a sense, at times an intuitive kind of communication. You may walk and suddenly feel, okay, maybe, maybe they, may, let me see, you know. I find many people very, you know, in takes, taking, uh, it's as if like in conversations with certain people, I have noticed they use shield of uh, theories which they have fully understood but not experientially. And so when man chooses to become certain in uh, an idea or a belief rather than experiential, uh, rather than an experience, direct experiential approach to it, you will see that uh, there is no need to search for truth because those people questioning truth are not being truthful to themselves. Your being aspect does not need to do anything ever, it exists. But through this being aspect, you have a self-aware intelligence, it's as if this is how the design is for mankind at this point, and human consciousness is being projected. So not only are you that wall in which the light of the projector is being shown, but you are also the light, the lens, and the intelligence that could always turn it off. But when I say turn it off, it never means reality turns off because there's innate impulses within man to explore. What that means is when physicality gets prevented, it doesn't mean that's it. Physicality is only an aspect. If, if I was to communicate how it goes is that if I was to put my finger suddenly inside, uh, let's say, a lake or something, just or a pond, just to feel the water, okay? That amount of my finger which is in the water the amount that's in the water, let us say that is uh, this human physical form. That is this life which, let's say, uh, I am living in regards to how I'm perceiving it. And what that means is physicality is kept by the non-physical. And so when you ask how do I study non-physical, you actually don't study. You're not searching. It is not in the realm of hierarchy. It is that which is observing the hierarchy. It is not just in duality. It is where duality in stillness and silence has become the totality of the moment. So what that means is you might have tried to look in books. Oh my God, how do I connect this concept? How do I connect this, 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 you know? And they even suggest uh, the work of many geniuses has been to blend different, uh, uh, different kind of uh, topics together in the sense that it's as if their life was an answer to a solution both those ideologies needed to survive. Now, it should be said that when we talk about consciousness, the being is on some level getting there. There is nothing that someone can say to you and you cannot consider, even though if you think you don't hear it. Every sound, everything in your space of awareness, literally the sphere of existence that you are, and awareness you are, uh, it is beyond your interpretation. So on some level, man needs to become aware of self-communication because that is really what memory is. Because what are you being reminded of? Where, where is this communication coming? And it's coming from you and from this uh, kind of, I do not want to say machine, but this multi-dimensional vehicle, which is the plane. Do you see? So... Um, If I was to perhaps sit down and wonder why anger exists, I would see it simply does because my attention is on it. And this suggests a fluidity that how you are thinking about thought is a phenomenon that will lead to a nonlinear edge. 
so mankind even though our sciences and our our many theories and you know our technologies are very linear you will begin to see if you were to observe where all this linearity is is where the foundation of platform is it is non-linearly kept and this non-linearity it's it's a ridiculous thing in which humanity is trying to figure out only through an objective understanding Many beings think they are just physically growing. No, as an energy, your presence is suggesting all that you see. So when you are given this immediate physical platform, which is you being aware you're an individual and you're walking in the park and you're seeing a tree and you're seeing some other people there, you suddenly begin to recognize that uh, observance is that which is beyond the game because the observer could not be found. So many people now who are very convinced by nationality are saying, gosh, it's like this is, I'm not fulfilled by this. And so when fulfillment comes into play, that's when the linearity, the linear approach of the being is like causing them too much of a burden. And so they're like, all right, I'm gonna trust life and see what's happened. And that's when actually for many people, they begin giving themselves this existential permission to be in flows of, uh, I, I can't say flows of consciousness, I, I've called it streams of consciousness before, but it's actually just you throughout the day, your, your awareness to things are different. So look at yourself right now, how you're looking, for example, at something, or how you're hearing the sound of my voice. All of this is sensory stimulation. So there's, there's our senses are being active and things are happening, but where is all sensory perception kept? And so you begin to see this is where man goes within a crossroads into just keeping into the external uh, objective world and being in question to infinitum, you know, because all objectivity has a temporal uh, quality to it. Or to begin to look at these things we call thoughts and to see if they are really an origination from us or may maybe is it, or it is something that man is simply just aware of. Do you know, as if like I'm walking in the park, I'm seeing, uh, how do I say it? I'm, I'm walking in the park, uh, I'm looking at a tree, you know, I'm looking at a flower, I'm looking at, you know, a squirrel and suddenly, bam, it's like there's then this idea of extinction, apocalypse, collapse, you know, all this stuff, do you see? Ideology, if it is observed, it is not you and your freedom is in the silence and stillness that is confirmed from within. But if ideology chooses to speak, you will find yourself to be the echo. Because if you choose your, your, your you, if you, I don't want to say choose, I mean it's not like a, <laughs> it's not like an emergency type of thing, it's just a, your awareness needs to find a sense of clarity here in this existence. So whoever you are, you don't need to go find books more than you just need to go and be in life and take a good look at life and sit down and just take it in and see what there is to give. Because guys, uh, a very wise man named Rumi had this quote and he said, before life takes away what you're given, give away all there is to give. I'm gonna go find the accurate quote. I would like to share a quote by a very realized human being, a human being from 900 years ago, 900 years ago. And his name is Rumi, and this was a very realized Sufi mystic. And he adds just this quote, and if we just take his quote and try to see what this human being was trying to communicate, he says, before death takes away what you are given, give away what there is to give. And so, kind of leading back to what was said, in this life, as you become observant of what is here, many times through the mystic's eyes, the valuations will change. Because you will go through environments where there's the ratio between the unknown and known factors are different. And those human beings who go and learn how to handle going into their unknown, uh, make the unknown more their known. They become more aware of how much they can create. What that means is that kid who is in the streets and that kid who isn't, they are different. They have different awarenesses. They have different situational views, you know.
And once you truly see it, the reason Rumi says, before take, death takes away what you're given, give away all there is to give, is because death will take everything. So in this life, if you're not giving your enthusiasm, giving your excitement, if you're not giving your, your existential expression, it's like, a, it's like a light of a candle helping people to see, you will begin to see you will not be fulfilled. Because again, just like that angry moment, you will be like, why, when I could have done something, I did not. And it's not, it's not in a sense something to have it to project guilt, but to see that the fulfillment of your life is for you to have a fulfilled experience and a fulfilled expression. And this must come from you constantly taking new looks at, your, at yourself. Because trust me, the reason there is stress and depression is because the individual is shaping himself, him or herself, uh, to such a point that uh, he or she is not seeing the life that is here and is rather seeing the ideology that are associating and keeping the life here. You shouldn't have too many thoughts on this life because man is a student. If we are the individual parts of it, we, should, we must not have the ignorance to say, oh, there's nothing in the hole, do you know? As it, as it has been suggested, um, another man's trash is another man's treasure. <laughs> One world and, for example, for man, his existential emptiness is existential fullness for another world. What that means is that moment where you felt sympathy or compassion or there was intuition, it was not just a communication of you and Casper's best friend, this idea of a soul that is floating around. It's a multi-dimensional communication between worlds that are present. So do you see what that means? Is mankind is just this biological being in one plane of existence where he's getting this awareness and it's, it's blending. It's as if different, it's as if we thought mankind was the significance, but no, it's how the world is communicating to itself and to other worlds. And when I noticed this, it was a very interesting phenomenon because you kind of look at your presence and you're like, gosh, if there is a sense of simultaneous acknowledgement of idea and the realities that idea projects, then there is again within you an emptiness that needs no definition. Mr. Within would like to tell you something which is quite interesting. And this is that there are certain books, ancient books, Vedic books, I believe, which are called the Upanishads. And these Upanishads, it's very beautiful because it's, it's, it's as if they're suggested that they were not written by man and they were not written for man. And I was like, gosh, that is the most confusing <laughs> comment on that. But then I recognized the reason is, is because it is at a different state of consciousness. What we are considering to be man and that normal guy, the average Joe, is just a being who's accepting certain imagery as to be his world. We all know that we are uh, beings who have experiences of static states and experiences of dynamic states. We have certain moments where we are understanding and observing things and seeing things through our stillness. And there are moments where we're looking at, at things uh, uh, in other words, uh, let me say it like this, when we are looking through stillness, we begin to see the movement of the world and there are moments when we are moving where we begin to see the stillness of the world. What that means is when two human beings fight, trust me, they are situated in stillness and so they are knowing what's going on. So what that means is if there's another human being in front of you, without you having to do anything or even before your eyes, you would know that you're situated there. And that is sometimes why people, as they walk around, they see, they feel there's something behind them. But what is behind them is actually just how they are conceiving an aspect of their reality. Duality, if it is something that you feel is coming from externality, you will be chained to something you are not letting yourself understand. But if duality comes internally and from within, you will see there is no need to doubt a natural phenomenon. Just like how you walk to uh, the store, 
uh, you don't think about your walk. Your walk is done by the intention of your knowing of where you're going. So similarly, as simple as that is the exploration of man beyond ideology. And so ideology seems to be what we are calling memory, but there is not only an individual conscious intelligence here. There is a collectively conscious intelligence. And what that means is if you thought there were only fingers, no, the fingers are kept by the palm. And this palm holds the whole cosmos in place by giving it projections of individuality. What that means is that there is certain pillars in the foundation of a building before the building can be built. For example, if you were to look at the amazing engineering phenomena in Dubai, they had to dig very deep because sand was not a stable surface. Do you know? And so their foundations had to go into a ground that was stable because the sand wasn't doing it. And you will find sometimes through life, your personality or how you're living or that person who has to go to work tomorrow, it, that projection of a life might not be satisfying perfect. And if it feels that way, it's because you're not, you don't have enough existential allowance in it. What that means is you don't like your boss. And you also don't like the regulations that are making you feel that we are a cog in a machine. You are not a cog in a machine, but you have an ability to see infinite machines if you choose to, but in an instant also to deconstruct them and even deconstruct your thought and move beyond a state of experience that is not individual. What that means is, what I find the Upanishad suggests is that there are the teachings of uh, Many of our ancient books are not, at the are, not, are not there for the people of the individual consciousness that has developed now. We think humanity has enhanced its external technologies, but his external technologies has made him subjectively create himself as well. What that means is what survival didn't tell us was that it was creating a sense of identity as well. And so we are seeing that this is where the greatest challenge of the human being is, because biological evolution is taking you to a point where you need to handle externality, but you must see that. Do you want to handle externality for your life? Do you want to just survive? Do you want to do, uh, be like the caveman? Or do you want to see that maybe there's a difference why uh, man has a, has a different responsibility than an animal? Because man has a self-awareness. What that means is that moment where the child and the human being is looking at himself in the mirror and recognizing he's something, that is a valuable moment. And that means that you are a self-awareness that chooses to see. What that means is uh, there's a difference between form and then sight, and sight then form. So the sight before form is selfless, shapeless, and an observance. And of course, guys, I want to tell you, uh, we must also acknowledge that knowledge and intelligence are very relevant to the actions of the being. So your abundance and success has nothing to do whether if you have a business planner or some financial advisors that's helping you, but more about how you're working with your life energies here. And your life energies are some basic considerations to the point that you need to take care of this physicality, but you also need to take care of the ideas that are associating with this physicality. What that means is if you think, gosh, I'm, I'm a person who fails and stuff, it's as if you're literally putting a bag of rocks behind you in regards to thought, and so this physicality doesn't feel safe. The pillars of existence must be aligned with the knowing that we are all temporal beings and regardless of how much you feel life is bullying you, you are listening to it in the sense that you are here as not just a traveler but as the journey. For many people listening to this talk are part of the road guiding many generations home. And this home is a sense of awareness and knowing that is a transcendentally situated sense of being. And what that means is you might not have an idea, you might not have even seen something, but the minute you are aware of your present moment, it doesn't matter. All activity is done in the flow of uh, uh, no expectation. What that means is the wise man begins to see, the sage begins to see that he must put aside who he thought he was to see who he really is. And when you do see who you really are, it is not something to talk about. This is where the being needs to respect himself, him or herself, it, you know. And of course, guys, when I talk about man, I'm not, uh, I'm talking about the human species, of course. 
because we need to have that generality. We need to get people comfortable into talking as the human species because they are then beginning with an axiom of union. What that means is if you think there's nothing, you know, then you are creating a certainty into just a temporal world. So what that means is, let's say like this, if, if, I'm, if we are both me and you are wondering about truth, it's as if like every moment we have an idea, how we are aware of that idea and the time frame in which that idea is in our memory, regardless if we write it or not, is, uh, is temporal. What that means is, regardless of how good the talks of certain people have been in the past, so many generations of human beings have lived on. And right now, we need to just think, in regards to our lifetimes, how can we be seeds? How can we plant seeds? Because seeds uh, will be how our work lives on. So right now, man must not try to think too much about uh, uh, getting rid of poverty, but creating a system when that person comes out of poverty, he can immediately rise to a state where he can help others in poverty. Because there's people who go through suffering are given the gift of understanding that experience and then they become communicators of it. You might find it a bit silly, but your suffering, your pain, and what you have been in, uh, regardless of what experience has taught you existentially, it has showed you the movement of physicality. Just like how Newton saw an apple fall from a tree, every moment the human being is seeing different actions being done. And we're working with different intensities. Through different people, we have different senses of consideration. In different environments, we have different behaviors. And this is suggesting the human consciousness is not bound to idea. And so if psychology is becoming a source of truth, The silence will be forgotten until the silence roars. Because what this means is that you are not considering how important and significant your existence is here and how it is integratively working with all human beings. It is up to man now to bring, uh, create space for new thought. And that means do not try to break thoughts, do not try to get rid of an ego or something like that. That's a mind game and a world of its own. You're more here to become aware of form and as you become aware of form, you just get more observance. You become more situationally aware. What that means is when you, when you look around, usually you get a better sense of your environment. So look around at the thoughts that you're having. And as you do, guys, this is where memory changes and it transitions. So if, I, if Mr. Rutland was quickly to create a metaphor metaphoric kind of spectrum and of course this is just for this moment and for the purpose of this talk if you were to look at the human being for the most of his life it is interested by what it is doing and so we see we cannot ignore physical survival However, we don't want to also just, just to survive, you know, I just don't want to go to work all day. So what must happen is that you must align two intentions in one. What that means is your work must become something you trust, you love, and every physical action you're doing is leading you to that state where you want. And you must have patience because there is a delay. Because if there is on one end a cause and effect relationship, but this cause and effect relationship is also going to the other side of this spectrum, which is becoming more instant, that means less, less cause and effect. Do you know, you begin to see that the mind of man was kept here before he could think. Because thought in its observance is hollow. For it is you who is giving beauty and is seeing beauty through your experiences out of the words of all those poets. And so if Rumi is standing beside us now, he is not standing as exactly how he perhaps lived then. He's standing in how he has been evoked by the attention to see the eternal wisdom in his voice. Man is not alone, but at time, man understands that sense of not being alone by going to the peak of loneliness and then letting go of all ideology that is suggesting that you did not have wings. For the sky is limitless and your intelligence 
multidimensionally capable of navigating between many, many uh, uh, coagulations of form and formless observance, if I can say. And of course, all that man can do is to look beyond man. You might find it surprising, but you are not here just to survive. You are here to be expressed and to be present because existence is in such a way. And when you recognize this, it does not matter who you are or who you think you are. It's all about the intensity and existential sensitivity you have in who you are and how you and your world are together one. What that means is you thought you had to have only teamwork with, uh, with uh, other people you know, in your class and whatnot. But teamwork is more than just a human being communicating to a human being. It is also between a human being communicating with his world. And when you have trust in the intelligence that is this existential movement, you begin to see that power could never be shaped. For it was the observance of the phenomena that was untouched. Your memories will shift. You will begin to become aware of how you are even considering your memory and your, in a sense, meditative awareness to it will shift it for you. That moment where you've just, without any trying to do a practice or something, you have just gone in nature and you've become still and silent and are just within your being, uh, observing what is here and what needs to be done. Not only is simplicity your friend, but complexity never was complex. What is memorable is you. And what is memorable is also beyond a consideration of a space and time which are the pillars of every theory known to man. Before an idea can walk, it must walk in a world of consideration. And so space and time are fixtures in man's psychology, which if you just try to look at in the dictionary to understand time, you will for a second see, wait a minute, I don't understand time, and you will see the phenomena of <laughs> the passage of conception that never was linear. Linearity was the blessing of the intelligence that was in the world, but not of it. For there is a moment of internal awareness to thought and form where you not only have your physicality present with your subtle realms and your awareness, you will shift from being a personality. So you will become aware that your body and everything is working here and you shift into a different projection of experience. And so there have been um, suggestions of yogis who've, who have had more than one body, but it's, uh, it's not a physical uh, thing. So we, it's not something that will serve uh, ideology in the way that man is using it to look at these things. It is also very important, guys, to be aware of um, what you are accepting as reality. And it's not that you should accept a certain thing. It's just that you should, at first, self-reflectively look at yourself, then go into different scenarios of self-reflection. So, in a sense, uh, first look at yourself in the mirror and see how you look like and then you have in the present moment uh, 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 your object of meditation being your conception.
and this observance will uh, shift the reality of man to a very uh, empty clarity. It's like you're not clear because you have the great the next formula that nobody knows. You are clear because you have nothing. You're aware of an existential aspect of your experience, which is no thingness. What that means is you're seeing when you say nothing, it's just an awareness beyond thing, beyond objectivity. And it, it seems like we always have it. Uh, so what that means is if you look at it, when you look outside, the world is objective. You're seeing things external, physical. You know, I could go touch that tree in the park. But when you look at yourself, it seems to be uh, thought in the form of a veil and some unknown quality which is constantly wondering about itself. When you trust your moment, the wonder of the unknown will come to how the known is standing and you will see understanding the way you're understanding things will move in a way where you're not standing on a thing. You don't need to have a statement before to then be able to say something. You can see it can originate from the novelty of your experience in this life as a being. And of course, freedom was always there before <laughs> there could be a shape for freedom. What that means is, if you look at the being, the, how the ape stood on its two legs, stood on two legs, it uh, did it, but before that, there was an intelligence that had done it, that it was there in the design, you know. So how that tree grows is based on how the seed was made, in a sense. But again, consider uh, your direct experiences beyond space and time. <laughs> your exper direct experiences beyond space and time will uh, will be your guidance. So what that means is, don't think that you need to ask too many people about things, so about your sense of spirituality and truth. Uh, just very sincerely work in this life until you begin to see in a very intelligent way where you're using your own wit into figuring things out. And this figuring things out gets to the point of even saying, why am I figuring things out? And that's when two ideas uh, hit one another and break. As if the two mirrors that were giving you infinite possibilities to think uh, hit one another. The two mirrors that were facing one another, right? So infinity is kept and it is the ability of formless observance to be in manifestation and it is part of the design. That is why we can have geometry uh, moving into uh, uh, an emptiness where the space can be recreated in that knowing of the, the absence. You know, so it's as if like uh, you know that once everything out of your room is out, there is the space to create something. But you also knew the room was there from before. Your intuition is how you know the room from before. Uh, your sense of moving between personalities and thoughts and considerations of identity is actually how much, hey, you have stuff in your room and hey, you take it out. And think of it in this way. Uh, you are acting much differently than you acted probably five years ago. You know? And the reason is because the stuff in that room has been changing. You have been going to a point where, oh gosh, I'm not this person doing these things. I'm this person. And you've seen that as much as the experiences have been allowing, you have pursued it. And of course, mankind must remember, if, if an experience is not allowing you, don't create an obsession. But always create the intelligence within you that knows that you can be where you know yourself to be. Because, guys, there's a difference between men. Napoleon has the story where he was walking, uh, where he was uh, trying to become emperor again from his exile. And as he's walking there, it's as if the whole city, and the king was in the castle, of course, scared or something, you know. And the king had uh, ordered guards around the castle, of course, the imperial guard. And so uh, Napoleon is walking with the crowd, and it's as if every person is just standing behind this man. 
as Napoleon goes up, he goes in front of these people and it's as if for a second he sees that all his men, all those people going with him, are pointing guns at all those people that are blocking the palace so uh, Napoleon doesn't go in there. And what happens next is really showing the ability of mankind. Because Napoleon commands his men to put down their weapons and he goes in front of the Imperial Guard and he says, I am your emperor. Who wants to shoot their emperor? Can you see the intention and the knowing of where this being was? As if he went in front of all those people who were given the command by the king to shoot him on spot and he said, I am your emperor. <laughs> you know, he didn't laugh like that, but he's <laughs> he said, I am your emperor. Who dares to shoot me or something like that? You know, and he, he opened his, uh, uh, what do you say? He opened his uh, shirt to, you know, give him that target. And what happens is phenomenal because all these people see that this is the intensity and the power of an emperor, not a king that is coward, uh, a coward in his room. What that means is it doesn't matter, guys, how privileged and non-privileged you are. When you know yourself to be in a certain projection of existence and you sincerely know it and honestly, and that means it's not based on conditions or anything else. You're just doing it for it is a natural aspect of your expression. It's very simply what you are. And simply that is just taking more. And you begin to see, you will feel uh, uh, your knowing being more intensified, you know? You will see that you are giving yourself the vision that will inspire your greater ability. I hope, my friends, this talk has served you. To be honest, memory is something that is for your self-exploration. And as you do, you become aware of how you're being here, which is very important. Because before the human ideology, we're a moment of being. There's this quote by Kabir, a realized being which I would like to share. He says, many know that the drop merges into the ocean, but few know that the ocean merges into the drop. And of course, it's something of this suggestion. suggestion. The, this is what the quote's kind of saying. And it was very, very insightful because we think that we are just in an individual evolution. We think that individuality is just going to collectivity, but we're not at the same time acknowledging how it, this, this world is self-reflective. So at the same time, collectivity is going within individuality. And beings who become aware of this moment where both of these meet is where uh, there is an emptiness of knowing. And you will see you are feel fulfilled by the blissful experience of your existence. Because thought didn't even have a chance to suggest that you are something. For when the experiencer recognizes that he's beyond the object of experience, You never forgot when you always knew, when you existentially and experientially knew your nature of being. Trust yourself, trust your moment. 
existential allowance is a gift that comes to you through your self-awareness and self-remembrance. Safety does not suggest the certainty of absolute experience. Beyond your face, you look through the eyes of the cosmos. Much blessings and honesty.